Okay, uh, good morning. It's a few minutes after nine, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we've got a, a small crowd today, but that's good. There's plenty, that gives us plenty of time for questions and things. Um, so uh, I think I've enabled it so you guys can unmute yourselves. So if you do have a question as we're going through, feel free to unmute yourself and hop in and I'll, I'll be happy to talk about them. We'll also have some questions, uh, time for questions at the end. But if you don't know me, I think I do recognize some familiar names on the list there. Uh, my name is Ryan Pancom, I'm a horticulture educator for U of I Extension, and uh, I have a background as an arborist and a forester, and you know, quite frankly, talking about trees is my favorite thing to do. So I'm happy to uh, be here today with you guys virtually. This was actually a, an in-person workshop that we had scheduled uh, for May sometime, and um, this is just, a, in, in this day and age, this is the best we can do today, is, is a virtual workshop. So thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I hope to have, uh, Lots of time for questions and interaction. That's great. I do like a smaller group for those reasons. And um, anyway, this presentation is about uh, site selection and tree planting. So what, what you might do to, to properly plan and plant a tree. So I have, you'll see as we go through this uh, presentation, a lot of great plant pictures. And I'll talk a lot about a different species of trees and shrubs and uh, should have uh, some great slides for discussion or questions and to show you guys just Hopefully look at a bunch of plant picks as we go through this. Okay, so let's start with a discussion of woody plant selection. I'm going to actually um, stop my video so I'm not on each one of these slides. Um, and so uh, talk, in terms of selection, um, our woody, woody plant materials that we add to the landscape really define that landscape. There's a uh, they make everything from the canopy that's overhead in, the ur in an urban setting to um, all those intermediate trees that are under it. They really define our urban spaces by framing that, those places and uh, defining the outdoor rooms that we uh, live in and exist in outside. But uh, to look at what is a suitable tree for some of these spots, we need to probably look at uh, a larger picture first. So what is the macro climate of Illinois? Well, uh, we, we usually assess that as gardeners or plant people by looking at the different climatic zones in the state. So if you see, we're right in the middle of the state up there and we're just above the line for climatic zone five. So you've probably heard that term before, uh, the USDA plant hardiness zones. We're a zone five and we're barely into zone five. So uh, the thing that's always confused me about these is that the lower the number, uh, the colder it is. So I always, I always have to think about that for a second, but lower the number, the colder it is. But um, over the past several, uh, 30 years or so, we've seen uh, some changes in these climatic zones, and that's as a result of climate change, as a result of us being able to better collect weather data. We maybe have some better better data that's contributed to that, but uh, these two, the, the picture you see at the left shows the changes in the past 10 years, and the picture at the right is the predicted change with climate change over the next 30. So when we plant a tree today, we pr it's probably going to live for 30 years, so we probably need to think about these shifting uh, plant hardiness zone. So um, if you look at the change in the next 30 years, we're essentially going to be a zone six. The, the, the line for zone five is going to edge all the way up, or, or for zone six is going to edge all the way up to Chicagoland and up into Wisconsin away. So uh, we need to actually plan a little bit for a little bit warmer of a climate. So along those terms, there's uh, another thing that we look at, and that's the American Horticultural Society heat zone map. So you can see that at the right there. And, and they're not exactly the same. This, you know, the, the plant hardiness zone maps are speaking in terms of cold temperature and a plant's tolerance, whereas the, the heat zones that we see at the right are talking about that high temperature, that hot, the, hot, the hottest it'll get. So um, not exactly the same, but something to think about in terms of when you look at a plant tag, you can usually see at least plant hardiness zones, they usually list. A lot of, a lot of plant tags these days actually have these heat zone maps as well, ratings as well. So um, if you think about it in context, for me, I always think in terms of hardiness zones, if you're at the edge of your hardiness zone for cold, or if it's a plant, a, nor a colder, you know, loving species that is barely makes it down to Illinois, you may pay closer attention to one or the other of these ba based on whether or not that plant's at the edge of its range for hot or cold. So that's kind of how you use those to interpret and figure out a plant. It's safe to say that you know, a lot of plants in terms of hardiness zones are listed as a zone three to eight or you know, two to five or whatever their range is. It's safe to say that if you're in the middle of that hardiness range, those zones, then that's, that's a plant that's gonna do pretty well here. So it's those plants that are on the fringe that are sometimes 
uh, difficult. So to go down to the smaller scale, let's take a look at just somebody's a backyard, a typical backyard, and what you know, what what would you expect out of this backyard? Well, um, if you want to picture the location labeled A there as a site that would get morning sun, that's a lot different than location C, where that would get you know sun all day long, so morning and afternoon sun, whereas uh, location D is very similar to A, where it would just get morning sun, it would not get the afternoon, where location B is gonna have some pretty strong afternoon sun. So that's some things to think about. Um, morning sun is definitely a lot, um, not as hot, not as intense as the late afternoon sun. So there's certain plants that, that are gonna like that morning sun and, and not be able to do well if they were in afternoon sun. So uh, that's something to, to, to understand as well. And most plant tags will say, full sun, part sun, full shade, part shade. It'll, it'll give you some type of designation like that so you can have an idea what, uh, what that plant would like going into it. But keep in mind, different spots in your own backyard can have different light levels. And um, you know, one thing that's just always surprised me is some places I've thought were full sun were not, <laughs> in fact, when I planted a plant there. So uh, what I kind of recommend is if, I, I know it seems intuitive that you know where full sun locations are and aren't, but um, it was a real learning process for me when we uh, started looking at getting solar panels. I realized my roof is not nearly as good for that as um, it is. So you may not have as great of a spot as you think. Uh, the best thing I can recommend is just on a sunny day, go out and take a look several times. And I've done it before with a digital camera today. You can take lots and lots of pictures. It costs you nothing. Just take a picture three or four times throughout the day. And then you always would have that to look back at in the wintertime when you're trying to plan. And you can see where by three o'clock your yard might start to get some shade. and uh, helps you kind of assess that. So some of these other aspects, we've kind of talked about light levels, but uh, moisture can be a big factor in the urban landscape. And in this picture here of red twig dogwood, uh, a nice little shrub native to Illinois, um, it can handle a little bit of wet feet. And in this place where this downspout's coming out, that actually is a pretty wet spot compared to other places. So um, especially with respect to our home landscape, all those places where runoffs coming off your roof, those are going to be wetter spots and some concentration. So need to think about those. And also uh, there's other spots in our yard that just maybe have poor soil. We'll talk about that a little bit later and have some poor drainage and tend to hold water. We usually kind of know about where those places are in our yard before we plant a plant, but there certainly are plants that are better suited to that. And here's two Illinois natives that are a couple of my favorite trees for wetter spots. So bald cypress is actually uh, we'll talk about it again a little bit later too, but um, it's a deciduous conifer, so it loses its needles in the wintertime, which is really unique and has a beautiful fall color before it does that. Uh, just an excellent urban tree, performs very well in the urban environment. Whereas uh, river birch, another excellent urban tree, great tree for planting, um, is uh, just maybe a 40, foot, 40 or 50 foot tall shade tree, so it's not the biggest, it's not as tall as a 100 foot oak. Uh, but does well in the urban environment and grows pretty fast. So when somebody asks me what, what's a fast, a quick establishing small shade tree, uh, river birch is kind of the one that I would recommend. Uh, so let's talk about temperature for a minute. Um, so this azalea here in full is in full bloom in this picture. It is just loving that spot. Uh, but some, one of the things that makes this spot probably so appeasing to this shrub is the fact that that brick wall behind the shrub uh, can absorb sunlight and radiate that back out and create just a little microclimate that's a little bit warmer. So especially around our homes and in urban areas and places where we have concrete or brick or stone, um, it's going to have that same effect where it absorbs heat during the day and it slowly releases that at night. So it'll be slightly warmer, um, which can be good in the wintertime or in the spring and fall, but there's times in the summertime where that's a super hot spot and can stress out a plant as well. So Think about that, uh, that heat release from some of these type of things that would absorb that. Um, we've kind of talked about light levels. I don't, I don't want to go into too much de more detail about this, but just remember that full sun is greater than six hours a day. So when you see that on a plant tag, full sun, you need to count on having at least six hours, uh, possibly more of, of sun to support that plant. Uh, wind exposure is a big deal in central Illinois, especially if you're in a rural area like me. Um, especially if you're in a rural area that is, you're completely surrounded by cornfields, we can get a lot of wind going. So um, what that serves to do is, uh, especially during the dormant season where, you know, a lot of our native trees would lose their leaves, like the tree in the bottom picture, uh, the conifer in the top picture has leaves on. So 
uh, what happens in the wintertime in, in really windy spots for some of these plants that still have their leaves is they get desiccation or they get dried out over the wintertime. So this is an aza another azalea at the right, which is an evergreen broadleaf plant. So it keeps its leaves all winter long. Um, really pretty shrub that you can plant um, in a semi-shade or semi-sun location. Um, at the left is hemlock. Uh, which is not quite native to Illinois, just, just across the border in Indiana, would, its native range would pick up. Beautiful evergreen plant, uh, nice light feathery foliage like that, but uh, hemlock is one that is especially sensitive to drying out in the wintertime. So if you're in a really windy rural spot, or even in town, sometimes on the edge of town, we can have some really windy spots. Uh, both of these plants would really suffer in the wintertime uh, from desiccation, so something to think about. Um, so soils, there's a lot we can look at with soils and talk about. Um, here you see two soil profiles pictured. Uh, so th these are soil pits where we're looking at the side of the, you know, the ground surface is at the top and the picture at the left goes down to about 40 inches you can see at the bottom. The picture on the right, I think in uh, centimeters, but I've tried to kind of scale the two so they're the same. Um, at left we have a uh, native prairie soil to Illinois. So look at that great layer of what we call topsoil. Probably for that 20, first 20 inches, it's really dark and black. That's really healthy, great looking topsoil. Where on the right, you can see a real difference. Um, what's happened on the right is there's been some uh, fill deposited on top of this soil. So uh, a home was built close to here or a building where a foundation or a basement had to be dug out. Uh, that material that was dug out was then spread across the land. And you, that's what you see in this upper layer that's just a jumbled up mixture of colors. Now, you can also see at the very tip top there, they've added a little bit of topsoil at the end. So there is a little bit of good soil there, but it's safe to say that everything above that kind of white line there of soil has been mixed up and jumbled up and compacted with equipment and has had some impact. So um, one, one of the best ways to understand this is as you're digging your planting hole or dig a test hole be maybe before you plant your tree, Try to assess whether you have soil at the left that is a pretty even color for that top 12 inches, which would indicate you've got a great prairie soil that's gonna be a great spot for tree growth and it's maybe not that disturbed. Whereas if you start to dig up a mixed up jumble, if you start to find little chunks of concrete and other things in there, um, you may be in a spot that in, you know, over the past hundred years or so has been disturbed at one time or another. So just something to understand and there's ways that we can actually kind of remediate that soil as we plant a tree. but um, that compacted upper layer there is something that's really tough for trees to get roots out into. So if you see that, you're going to need want to have some extra care and uh, follow-up care and taking care of that tree to make sure it gets established. Uh, so we've kind of talked about this. Urban soils suffer from compaction, which reduces the pore space in a soil and reduces um, the the air and water exchange capacity of the soil. So roots need both air and water. So uh, that can be a big change when we have something impacted. So what we can always do to solve those problems is one way or another incorporate some OM or organic matter. And there's a number of different sources listed right there. I'd say locally my favorite source for organic matter is if you go to the Urbana Landscape Recycling Center, you can buy their, their prepared compost product. And it's just wonderful. It's got the consistency of like coffee grounds. It's dark black organic matter. And um, just getting that incorporated into the upper 12 inches of soil, as much of that as you can mix in with a tiller or by hand with shoveling in your planting hole or the area you're going to plant your tree, that's a great way to remediate that soil and give it a little more organic matter and, and help your tree be healthy. Blueberries are an example of a plant that does really well here based on its uh, cold hardiness and suitability to our climate, but it has very specific soil requirements. Blueberries take very acidic soil. So um, that's just, there's not a ton of shrub, trees and shrubs that really have that uh, real specific requirement on pH, but blueberries are one of those. However, they do make a beautiful uh, landscape plant if you can get them established. But in the case of blueberries, you probably have to start about a year ahead of time acidifying the soil, which isn't all that difficult to do, but probably requires some soil testing and things. So although blueberries are actually really beautiful, they do have special soil requirements we'd have to follow and uh, there's great instructions for that on some extension sites online and other things I could refer you to if you're interested in planting some blueberries. But uh, now let's talk about some of the aesthetic reasons we might select a woody plant. So one of the first I'd like to talk about is habit or the form of the plant. So here you can see a bunch of different mature habits of different trees. Um, and so 
uh, when we're planting this tree as a tiny seedling or whatever size plant we might start with, it's really hard to picture that mature canopy and what it'll be, but that's something at planting time even we have to pay attention to. So in this case, this American elm, if you look at those different little diagrams across the top, which one of those shapes that does this elm fit best? Um, I would say it probably fits that vase shape habit the best. And, and really that makes just an awesome urban tree. Um, you know, I, I used to work as an arborist in Champaign-Urbana doing tree care and in, in residential, at, in, in homes and residential areas. And one of the things I always describe to our, our clients is this V-shaped tree that makes just a beautiful urban tree. It, it allows you to, um, this habit, this growth habit, if you have one of these trees that will grow kind of into this vase shape, is very prunable to allow for clearance. So in this case, there's a blue spruce there that probably has a little bit of shade from the elm, it would be really easy for an arborist to prune that up and make it more V-shaped and give that uh, blue spruce a little more shape or if a little more room, or if your house was there, it allows for pretty easy pruning up for some home clearance or whatever and just makes a nice tree that lets some light in from the sides, doesn't cast full shade underneath itself if we want to have some shrubs or hostas or something growing under it. So, uh, so that's an example of a vase-shaped tree. Um, this sugar maple, I always picture more as oval almost oval to conical uh, when it's young, but as this tree develops and gets larger, it's probably going to tend more towards a round to a vase-shaped habit. So um, that's an interesting thing to think about that a lot of plants will actually transition from one of these habits to another at maturity. So cottonwood is a wonderful example of that, where um, if you look at a cottonwood that's um, five to 10 years old, it's almost gonna look as conical as a pine tree. You know, very pyramidal, very conical, but by the time it matures into a tree this size, if you look at that, that's very vase shaped and open, more open. So um, there's a lot of trees that are like this. Sweet gum's another commonly planted landscape tree that does this. So understand that, that maybe your mature habit could be a little different than the, the habit in its early years. So uh, here's an example of English oak, um, which has this uh, columnar habit that keeps, stays really skinny. So English oak's probably the main uh, landscape tree I can think of that has that, but if you're interested in this, I really like this um, type of growth habit for uh, gardens that you have a lot of things planted under the tree, because in this case, this English oak doesn't cast a lot of shade down there. You can have almost full sun plants right up and around the base of this English oak in a landscaping bed, so it allows you to have not only a tree there, but also a full sun area below it for other plants, and so there's a lot of really cool cultivars out there of, of lots of trees that you might think of that, that uh, growers have been able to breed to have this growth habit, one of which is sweet gum. They make a really columnar version of sweet gum that just stays only three feet wide, it's 30 feet tall, has the beautiful fall color that sweet gum has. Um, one that I recently purchased was a, a saucer magnolia, and I think Sunspire was the cultivar name, but uh, there's a couple others that are like this, but it's a really skinny and narrow uh, saucer magnolia that only gets about three to four, maybe five feet wide, but about 30 feet tall and has yellow flowers, which is a little different than your typical saucer magnolia it has white to pinkish flowers. Uh, but anyway, uh, the point, point being there's a lot of trees you can get in this growth habit if that's what you're going for to kind of save some full sun areas beneath the tree you plant. The other thing to think about is just how wide the spread of a mature tree could be. So right there you see a white oak that's probably three times as wide as it is tall. At the right we have a compact arborvitae that's probably not going to get super big ever in its life. But uh, one thing to understand about open grown trees, especially our natives like oaks and other large shade trees, is they really are going to have quite a bit of spread. So it's important to plan for that so you don't have a shade garden where you, you may not want a shade garden. And especially in central Illinois, if, if you go and look on the web at uh, a, a, a spread for a certain tree and see 50, 30 feet maybe the spread, in central Illinois we have such awesome prairie soils. If it's on a really good, fertile, well-drained prairie soil, that tree may get bigger than its actual uh, predicted size. So really need to plan for that spread of the canopy for a mature shade tree. All right, so let's talk for a minute about flowers as one of the aesthetic values we might choose a plant for. So uh, the color, the size, and maybe the fragrance are some of the things that they add to the landscape and some of the reasons why we may or may not select a plant. So here's a few different plants with beautiful flowers. Southern Magnolia is probably one that we are just 
on the fringe of its hardiness zones. I, I would guess that it's not hardy to zone five. Now I've seen a few of those planted uh, in central Illinois that have made it in a sheltered location. So that's another thing to think about with your backyard and your microclimate. Uh, you may be able to find a spot in your backyard that's sheltered enough that a southern magnolia wouldn't wouldn't be exposed to the chilling winds that would uh, you know could probably make it uh, die back during the wintertime. So beautiful plant, evergreen foliage, uh, flowers just almost continuously through summer. I'll have those little white flowers popping up. Uh, tulip poplar then is another one that is a native tree to Illinois, so it does wonderfully here um, and has those beautiful yellow flowers. I think we often discount for this tree because. Uh, they come out right after the leaves. So a lot of times we miss those because we don't we see the leaves there. And at the bottom, there's another native flower to a plant. I don't know if anybody knows this one off the top of their head, but that is pawpaw. So neat, interesting little flower on pawpaw. So pawpaw is a native shrub that does well, or a native tree, small tree, that does well in um, part shade to full shade and almost all the way out to full sun. So it really is versatile. It never gets real big. Uh, but does great as a little patch of trees. So at the back of my yard, as my yard kind of fades into a woodland, I've planted a little patch of pawpaw there that I hope to grow up and be kind of the edge, the border of my woodland that's part shade and makes a beautiful little tree um, and actually has edible fruit. Um, interestingly, it's the largest native uh, tree fruit to North America. So apples and oranges and things weren't actually native here. Uh, Sweet Spire is just a wonderful plant for its fragrance. So uh, it blooms for, for just, oh, dang near like a month um, through the month of June or so. So probably getting ready to bloom soon here um, around central Illinois, but um, it's fragrant. So if you walk by one of these sweet spire shrubs, you'll smell it. So it's a great one to plant someplace like along a sidewalk that you're, you visit often, or um, I'm actually coming to you guys from my back screened in porch right now. I plan to replace some spirea shrubs with a uh, sweet spire because I love that smell and sitting on my back porch, it adds a nice smell to the air. I also have uh, a Korean spice viburnum right in front of me here uh, that I'm staring at. And that's another one that has a wonderful scent. And we'll look at it in a minute with respect to its leaf color, but uh, it has a wonderful scent. And so do some of the other viburnums. They're very fragrant. They bloom early in early spring. So my Korean spice viburnums already bloomed. If I got my sweet spires installed this spring like I wanted to, I'm a little bit behind on some gardening. Uh, I would have now, like I would have my sweet, my Korean spice uh, viburnum that just went out of flowering and just lost the scent from it and sweet spire coming in. So I'd have a fragrant porch for the months of May and June. So that's something to think about too, that uh, some of these plants can really add a nice smell. Uh, this is flowering quince, not a native to Illinois, but does wonderful here. And this is a picture from like the first of March or something in Southern Illinois, you know, which is a little bit warmer than here. And this big woolly shrub was at the corner. I used, I lived in Southern Illinois for about 13 years before moving back to Central Illinois in 2017. And this big behemoth of a shrub was at our driveway uh, when we bought the last house we lived at in southern Illinois and I just about cut it down the first winter we lived there because it was just such a big gnarly bush uh, but this this was that first March then and I walked out to get the mail and this thing was just alive with pollinators so I realized that this plant really does a lot in the early 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 spring to support pollinating insects that are out a lot of honeybees are on it and other things so really neat kind of flowering display um, all the way back down the stem. Um, like things like Korean spice by Vernum uh, would actually only have flowers at the tips where quince is nice. It has it all the way back down to the inner part of the canopy. And to this day, this big woolly shrub is probably doubled in size and is still growing down Southern Illinois and um, supporting those pollinators. So now let's talk about some of these woody plants in terms of fruit, because that can be a really pretty aspect we can add to the landscape as well. So this is a uh, Catoni ester. Uh, so uh, that's, how, that's how we say that, I guess, the genus name, Catoni ester. Uh, always been an interesting one, a fun one to say, but I love this plant because it has those little evergreen leaves, those stay on the plant year round, and those contrasting red berries just make a, for a beautiful display in a landscape bed. So this plant probably has hundreds of cultivars, literally, that are sold, cultivated and sold worldwide. So you can get it in everything from a creeping ground cover type of a shrub to a tall, some of the older versions of this plant are taller, more what we think of as a traditional shrub. So a lot of different forms and growth habits of this. Uh, not a native, but um, certainly beautiful and ornamental and does well in our climate. And here's the good old Korean spice viburnum we talked about earlier. Uh, very fragrant flowers in the springtime, but then, gosh, this beautiful fall color and fall display, and then these black contrasting fruits that birds will slowly eat 
over the winter time. So it attracts birds. Um, it's one of my favorite spots for birds to land behind my porch, just because it's probably one of the larger shrubs there. But a nice one, obviously not a native, but just a beautiful shrub to add to the landscape for a number of reasons. And here is redbud. So we pro probably a lot of us think of redbud for its flowering display. Here I'm talking about it in terms of its fruits. You can see the little fruit pods there. And I don't know that it's necessarily a positive aspect of redbud that it has all these abundant fruits. Uh, it actually becomes a bit of a weed in some of my gardening beds um, and things. So that's something to think about with certain trees we do add to our landscape. Uh, we may be creating a little, a little bit of a weed problem. Um, and not that redbud seedlings are that big of a deal. I, you can just pull them out, especially if the soil is a little mulch, moist, you can just kind of pull them out as they come up. But uh, something to think about. Some other plants can be a lot worse about that. Here's probably one of the worst offenders from fruit um, is sweet gum. I think we've all probably dealt with these sweet gum balls at one time or another. I would argue that any sweet gum's fall color is so spectacular. It's worth putting up for, with the gumballs or other months of the year, but um, it can actually be a real tripping hazard. You can roll your ankle pretty easily on these if they're over a driveway or a sidewalk. So something to think about before planting a sweet gum. I think a lot of us just kind of inherit sweet gums that were already there. But um, anyway, beautiful tree, native, um, you know, does really well in the urban setting in, in Illinois. So uh, still a good one to plant, but just be respectful to its fruit. Uh, here's, here's a genus of plants, ho the hollies, that are known for their fruits. And, um, you know, American holly has those evergreen leaves and red berries and just a beautiful contrast, kind of like Catoni ester. Whereas deciduous holly, at the right there, a native plant, um, has, the, has berries that uh, stick on its, that just abundant berries like that in the wintertime. A really pretty plant for the wintertime. Birds love those berries. Um, and just kind of a neat one because it's a holly that loses its leaves, where all the others, like inkberry, would keep its leaves and have those little black berries. But uh, one thing to pay attention to with hollies is that you need to have both a male and a female plant. They're, that's what's called di a dioecious plant, where the, the male and female flower parts are on separate plants, where a monoecious plant would have them all on the same plant. So in the case of an oak tree, there's male and female flowers on every oak tree, and they create the fruits that way. Whereas a holly needs a male plant and a female plant to uh, have actual fruit production. Um, one interesting thing the horticulture industry has done, I love this, um, is they've, they've taken uh, some of these hollies that are a male and a female plant and put them in one pot and basically sold you two shrubs that they call, I think, the, the varieties I always think of as holly that I used to plant uh, back in the late, early 2000s, kind of the most popular cultivars were uh, Blue Boy and Blue Girl, or China Boy and China Girl. And so uh, you'd see these in a nursery as Blue Family instead of Blue Boy and Blue Girl, you know, where you'd buy separate plants. They put them both in one pot and sell you both as one shrub and just kind of a neat, innovative way to, to get folks a, a holly that's fertile. But I've always planted them as separate, you know, male and female plants and just kind of added them to the landscape that way. But do be aware, if you plant a holly, you need to have two. And there's some other plants that fall into that category too. Um, to think, to think about. So uh, now on to leaves. What do we think about from the aesthetic value of leaves? There's a white oak, white oak's fall color right there. So our state tree is white oak and it has a really pretty fall color. I think a lot of folks kind of don't, don't think of all the time, but um, you know, shape, color, texture, those are some of the things that we look at. So the, the variegated dogwood leaf in the bottom right, there's a variegated leaf where it's two different colors. Uh, some leaves have interesting shapes and some have interesting textures. So bald cypress at the bottom left there has a nice light feathery texture. We'll look at that compared to something that that'd be a fine texture compared to a coarse texture. But uh, one of the most unique leaves you can get on any plant in Illinois is from the ginkgo. Uh, not a native tree, uh, native to Asia, but does very well here. And really because it's outside of its home range, has next to no pests or diseases. Um, just makes a wonderful urban plant. It's adapted to the urban environment. Uh, has the interesting leaves in the, su in the summertime, nice fall color. But uh, one thing to know about ginkgo is it is a dioecious plant and it has fruit that when it falls on the ground, it's really stinky. Uh, so you may have smelled these on UVI campus. There's a number of these I can think of that really, really kick out the fruit and really smell from a, up, sometimes up to a block or two away, you can smell these trees. So uh, how, do you do, how do you prepare for that at planting time? We don't have any way to prepare for that. Um, you know, I, if somebody really, really wants a ginkgo, I recommend you plant two, and odds are, hopefully one of those will be a female. 
Unfortunately, you won't know if it's male or female for probably 10 to 15 years before it starts to produce fruit. So it's really hard to cut down that mature, maturing ginkgo when it starts to kick out the stinky fruit. But uh, maybe the saving grace is that those fruits are only there and stinky for a little while till they kind of rot or you clean them up. And again, it's a, it's a hassle, but maybe it's something that's worth dealing with for kind of the beauty and uniqueness of, of a ginkgo tree. Uh, here's tulip poplar again. We looked at it for its flowers earlier, but it actually has a really unique leaf. Uh, I think folks probably think it looks like a tulip, and that's maybe where it got its name. So uh, it's a native tree, does great here in Illinois, and has kind of a unique, interesting leaf we could add to the landscape. Uh, here's a hydrangea that was bred for variegated leaves, like we kind of saw in that little dogwood leaf earlier. But a really interesting, beautiful, stark plant. It draws your eye in the landscape. I think the biggest mistake from a design aspect we can make with leaf variegated leaves is to add too many of these to one place because they tend to be a little too much and kind of draw our eye to one area. So it's, it, I view, so that's one of the mistakes I think I see a lot with variegated leaf plants, in my opinion, and that's my opinion, um, I think you just need one as a specimen, kind of like this is planted as opposed to having a whole row of these. Um, to me, it doesn't look super native and natural and, uh, and it's just something we've kind of bred for. Another thing to think about with these plants, um, is we've changed the, the physiology of those leaves to get this, vari this variegation. And a lot of times these plants are a little more sensitive to drought stress and uh, stress from the sun in full sun sight. So uh, be aware of that and just realize if you're looking at a variegated plant, yes, they're beautiful, but you may need to do a little research to make sure you're not going to plant it somewhere where it'll struggle because it's too dry or too, too hot or too sunny. So something to think about with variegated leaf plants. Um, Here's Colorado blue spruce, um, just one of the most beautiful dark blue evergreen foliages you can get out of a needle. Um, very, very pretty plant, unmatched in the Illinois landscape, but Colorado blue spruce is not native to Illinois and unfortunately suffers from a lot of disease and insect issues as it matures. So this is one of those plants that's kind of on my naughty list. You can find it at about any garden center, but I would not recommend planting a blue spruce in Illinois. Uh, just due to all the problems it has with our climate and soils and other things. So, uh, but again, you'll find these commonly sold and um, they're really tempting when they're young and healthy looking to plant, but please avoid blue spruce. We've got a number of great um, recommendations for uh, other species that are similar I could, I could provide. Um, this is a false cypress, is what I've always just called this plant. Um, I just really love this evergreen. It grows into a this is golden mop, so it has kind of a rounded shape, a kind of a globe shape as it matures, but I love how it has this just highlighter yellow outer foliage, and this day was kind of cloudy when I took this picture, so you can't see how bright and brilliant that foliage is, but the inner foliage is dark green. It doesn't get as much sun. It's dark green contrasting out to this, you know, highlighter yellow colored outer foliage, and you can do some really neat things with pruning. If you start to prune this plant and open up some areas where you can really show some of that shaded area that has the contrasting darker colors. It's just a really neat, um, interesting plant. I think it's under, under planted and does really well here in Illinois. Uh, this is red maple, native tree. Um, com very, very popular as a landscape tree and for its, you know, just spectacular fall color. Um, there's a lot of different cultivars out there, red maple. So do a little research on what cultivar you may be purchasing. Some are uh, bred to be larger, smaller, or uh, most all are bred for good fall color. That's one of the things we usually look at in these. Um, but uh, one thing I will say about red maple is that it has, uh, they have some issues with soil, with soil issues and girdling roots is one of the things that they get a lot. Um, so it just is, we'll talk about proper planting depth as we get to the planting portion of our discussion today, but just a plant that it's really, really critical that it gets planted at the right depth or it'll have some, some root problems. So as an alternative, another native I would highly recommend um, for its fall color is black gum. And I think this is a very underplanted tree, but it's becoming uh, more and more available in nurseries. I'm seeing it around more and it's one that uh, I used to view as just a forestry. It's again, a native tree. Um, I hardly saw planted that often until I went down to SIU to finish grad school and there's several, there's a whole kind of little stand of these that are right outside the ag building and you know, a high, high traffic area. Students just trample the root systems of those by cutting off the sidewalk and does really well. So I, I mean, I view it as like one of the toughest urban conditions and they're just great looking trees and boy, you just can't, I mean, next to sweet gum, this is probably the best fall display of, of any 
any native tree in Illinois. So a great one to add. Uh, so we talked about bald cypress and its fine textured foliage. Here's leather leaf by viburnum that is coarse. So those are two opposite ends of the spectrum from a texture, a texture standpoint. And when we, when we put a couple plants like this next to each other, they contrast well and they add to the landscape and make it more unique. And so that's, that's kind of my, my take on texture is I like to mix it up. I like to have different textures uh, mixed throughout the landscape. So, so think about that. If you're looking for what, what should go next to this shrub, um, is the shrub you're looking at that's already planted, is it our coarse or fine texture? Maybe you could add the opposite uh, next to it. So, all right, now let's uh, start our discussion of planting uh, trees and shrubs. So how are we gonna do it? When are we gonna do it? And how are we gonna, and, and why are we gonna do it this way? So uh, here's some of the main, main uh, concerns when determining planting time. So, so what determines this, this planting time? Well, uh, soil temperature does. If it's frozen, we can't plant a tree. So, um, you know, that's a big factor there. We can't dig a hole in a big ice cube chunk of the ground. So uh, we want the soil temperature to be warm enough. We don't want a super hot sunny day. Um, we want a nice cloudy moderate day would be great. And so time of the year, what's the best time of the year to plant a tree? Well, uh, honestly, you could plant a tree or shrub just any time the soil isn't frozen is probably what we could do. And based on what time of year it is and how much natural rainfall we have, that would dictate how often we do or don't have to water. So a lot of folks plant in the springtime because we have a lot of rain this time of year and you don't have to water and nurse that tree along quite as much. Uh, fall is another excellent time, the end of the season. So October, uh, just a nice time of year to be outside. Great time to plant trees that um, actually a lot of folks don't think of fall as that is a very good time to plant trees, but it's my favorite time to put a tree in the ground. So I think trees, I've seen, at least in my experience, fall planted trees, in my opinion, do better than spring planted trees because they have, um, some of the winter time they'll get, a, when the soil temperature is above about 45 degrees, they'll actually be developing some roots over the winter time. So when that spring rain hits, they've got a little bit of an expanded root system and they're ready to hit the ground running. So fall is probably the best time, spring is the second best, and you know, really all through summer is a fine time to plant trees, but if you plant a tree in July, you're gonna, it's safe to say you're gonna have to water that tree at least once a week to get it through uh, its first season. So it just all kind of comes down to how much watering you wanna do. Uh, so how are woody plants sold? Because there's a number of different ways we can get them. Uh, good old bare root seedlings, these are the kind that, you know, a lot of times just look like a stick, uh, sticking out of the ground. Cheapest, easiest to plant, uh, but you have to get them at certain times of the year. So if this is what you wanted to plant, um, we, it would only be available during times of the year when they can be shipped to you as a dormant plant. So that'd be early spring, sometimes in late fall you can find these, but the nice thing is there may be the cheapest way if you had a lot of trees to plant, that's probably what you would use. Whereas there's a lot of things that come these days as these packaged plants in a small pot. Um, it's really not even, it's, it's kind of like peat that they're potted in there and this is a little uh, blueberry shrub that I ordered um, and got through the mail which I always fascinates me that you can mail order a lot of plants these days but uh, surprisingly they, they do surprisingly well so um, although I like to give our local nurseries as much of, of my business as possible um, there's times where there's something like a blueberry of a particular variety or something that we just can't find locally and it's, it's great to go to the internet and there's just a million things out there. I guess my best recommendation with sources on the internet is try and pick a nursery that's in our same climatic zone or very close. Um, and so, you know, don't pick some place from Oregon or, or somewhere to ship it to you. Uh, there's a lot of Midwest nurseries online that have some great selections of plants, uh, whatever you're looking for. So uh, to the larger end of the scale, there's a good old bald and burlap tree. So these are what we see at nurseries a lot. Um, they're, you know, probably the most expensive and largest plant material we can buy, but uh, the planting time is very flexible because uh, at any point of the season, this nursery can pull that uh, tree out of that mulch and go plant it in your yard for you. So if that's July, then, then they can plant it then. If, if the soil's not frozen in the wintertime, they can plant it then. So it allows a lot of flexibility. So that's maybe one of the benefits of this. Uh, what are some of the disadvantages? It's more expensive, it's very heavy. You know, some of those, those root balls easily approach 300 pounds on some of these bigger trees. Um, and you know, these plants are in probably the most shock of any, the base, base, uh, it's safe to say that the larger, the larger the plant we purchase, the more shock they're in when we put them in the ground. So that's called transplant shock. 
and that plant's gonna be in transplant shock until it can extend its roots outside of the planting hole that we planted it in and start to become established in the landscape. For a large, I mean, for most trees, we count on that being two to three years after planting, they're in transplant shock, probably need to have some watering in the hot part of the year, like July or August, and probably need to be watched closely. And after that third year, we kind of say, okay, they're probably out of transplant shock. You see the tree start to respond and start to grow well, and you know it's got out, gotten out of that, where a lot of these plants won't need to be watered after that, but will need some follow-up. So understand, although you're buying a, a bigger tree that, you know, the day it gets planted, it's over your head and looks big and healthy, um, it's in transplant shock for sometimes up to five years then, where a smaller plant, maybe like this container-grown material, uh, I would argue in tw 20 years from now could have the same size almost because your larger tree was in shock for so long, it took it five years to really start growing where these smaller plants may be able to come out of transplant shock in a couple years. So my favorite uh, plant planting material when I'm adding trees and shrubs to the landscape are these container plants. But uh, what I've found over the years though is they're a little more difficult to find all the different varieties we want. If you really want one of those crazy things like a, a saucer magnolia that's a columnar habit and has yellow flowers, you may have to go buy it as a bald and burlap tree because that's what a lot of the specialty nurseries tend to have some of that material in. So anyway, I've, I love uh, container plants the most. If that's what you can find, they're one of the best sources just because they're not in as much shock. Uh, but one of the issues with container plants is that they can be pot bound like this maple tree you see and um, can have circling roots and some problems with that. So that's one thing is I'm kind of looking at nursery stock um, and trying to pick my plant out from some of this container stock. Uh, it's something to maybe look at. You can kind of poke your fingers down in and feel for if it's just a massive water roots in there, that may not be a great plant to buy because it may have been in that pot for two or three years and not been sold and is really root bound. And sometimes they, a root system like that bound one right there just has a really hard time changing and responding and spreading out and growing and coming out of transplant shock. So. Uh, not so sometimes when we find a ton of roots in the pot, it's not always a good thing, but uh, safe to say most of the time uh, a lot of roots in that pot are usually good if they're not just a big massive me you know bound up mess like that. So now uh, it's time to plant. Let's take a look at what what might be the ideal planting setting and, and ways to do that. So this picture was taken at a local nursery um, a couple of falls ago. And this was like, it just so happened by coincidence, I got the perfect, you know, planting conditions that day. It was probably about 50 degrees and cloudy, no wind, and just about to rain. You know, soil was dry, but um, I could plant. So I didn't have really hot sun. I didn't have really windy conditions. So that's what's gonna dry out our plants. That's what's gonna make it just a harsh, harsh place for you to pull a plant out of its pot or expose those roots to some air and things as you're, as you're burying your tree, so to speak, into its planting hole. So be aware that if it's a really hot day, you're gonna have to be careful to not expose roots to heat and stress out your plant too much before you get it in the ground. Um, so one of the major aspects of tree planting that a lot of folks overlook is um, planting at the right depth. And what makes it so tricky is that a lot of the plants we get from a nursery or from a landscape center, um, are, are a little too deep in their pot or bald and burlapped a little too deep. And that's just a result of nursery production processes. They aren't exactly perfect. Those guys are producing thousands of trees a year and they have to do it as best they can. And so a lot of times these, these plants are a little too deep in the pot or the ball and burlap and it buries that root flare. So the part where the trunk starts to expand a little bit. Um, so that root flare needs to be planted right at or slightly above the soil line. So if you ever watch me plant a tree, I know a lot of folks think I've planted that a little too far out of the ground because I really wanna get that root flare up there and exposed to air and sun and wind and light. Um, I mean, it, you really want, it, we found over the last couple decades of research that that is a really important transition zone between trunk and root tissue. And we really want it, again, exposed to sun and light. If we cover that up with soil, uh, one of the problems we can get is girdling roots. Um, if we uh, cover that up with mulch, one of the problems we can get is uh, just reduced function of the, the, um, the tissue in that area. So all the conductive tissue of a tree, it's uh, veins and arteries, so to speak, are right inside the bark. 
And in recent years, we've learned that bark even has photosynthetic cells in it, where there's even some photosynthesis, like happens in the leaves, uh, happens in the bark and around that basal flare area. So if we cover it with mulch or soil or anything, we've, we've made those, it's just a little bit off there and it's not quite as healthy. So um, what might that look like when we try to identify that in a, a, a root ball? Uh, here's a couple pictures of a good, what I wanna say a, a good and a poor quality root ball. And if you look at the right, you know, that tree has been put way too deep into its root ball. Again, not intentional, just a result of nursery practices. But um, if we were to plant that at the top of the soil line of the ball, imagine how deep that tree would actually be in its hole uh, on the right there. Where on the left, that the, the basal flare you can see is right about at the top of the ball. And so that one we would actually plant right about at the level of the root ball. So if you're going through and trying to pick the perfect tree from some nursery stock, this is one of the things that I'm looking at in the, in the nursery is, can I see the root flare at the top of the pot or the ball and burlap? And if you can, maybe you ser keep searching for one that you can find it on. Uh, if you don't find it, it's not the end of the world. Um, if, you know, because a lot of times the same species, if you're looking for say a white oak or whatever it might be in the nursery, they're all gonna be, have been produced the same way. So they might all be in their ball too deep. Uh, it's not to say it's a plant you shouldn't necessarily purchase. You just would want to, have some special care and take some time to make sure and dig down before you plant uh, to find that. So here's an example of a containerized plant. Uh, that This was actually an English oak I planted as part of a master gardener training last fall. And uh, look at my finger in the left there is pointing to the root graft. And in the right picture, I've drawn an arrow over to where that root there, the stem graft is. And the first root was, you know, about four or five inches below where the top of that pot was. So if I planted it at the top of the, the soil level, I would have buried that root flare and that tree would have problems. So um, if you don't know what a root graft is, that's actually where they take, um, you, you graft on a bud or a twig to a, a root system. So you cut off the above ground growth, graft it on, and then you get a different tree above ground than you have below ground. So in this case, um, a lot of English oaks, they graft onto white oak rootstock or swamp white oak rootstock. And that's because uh, English oak has, if you've ever had an English oak, it gets powdery mildew pretty bad. And if you add uh, the above ground plant parts of the English oak to a different root system of oak, uh, it builds some resistance to powdery mildew. So it, it makes it not as unattractive of a plant in the late summer when that uh, powdery mildew tends to kick in. So it's kind of an interesting bit of horticulture there and how we grow and produce trees in the nursery trade. But uh, so now let's talk about kind of the hole we would plant. Uh, so, or the hole we would dig before we plant our tree. So notice this is a shallow and wide hole. So we want it to be two to three times wider than the tree. And I mean, honestly, sometimes I dig a hole that is double this width if I have the space that I can mulch that whole area after I dig it up. And the reason being, again, it goes back to transplant shock and trying to get trees out of transplant shock faster all those roots from that ball can expand out into that loosened soil really well. When they hit the edge of our planting hole, they hit more compacted soil just because it hasn't been dug up and loosened well in, in recent years. And so the wider we can dig that hole, the more of a loosened area of soil we give this tree to quickly expand its roots into, and the faster we can bring it out of transplant shock and get it established. So um, that's, that's one of the reasons why we dig that hole. I do want to highlight this last bullet point here to roughen up the sides of the hole. And that's important because um, as we dig with a shovel into the soil, we actually smear over some of the pore spaces and actually create a little layer there that can actually be hard for a root to grow through when it does reach the edge of our planting hole. So after you, before you start to backfill, if you just take a hand trowel or something and just kind of scrape up the sides of the hole, that's what we mean by roughing it up. Um, when that, someday when a root hits there, it'll have an easy way to enter the rest of the soil. So uh, this slide's looking at kind of plant, planting too deep. So the tree at the left, look at how it was planted a little too deep. Obviously its root flare was buried and those roots had to grow all the way up and across to reach the surface layer where they wanna get to moisture and nutrients and all the things they need. Um, at the right, that tree was planted too deep and probably had a girdling root that started to constrict the trunk. So a girdling root is a root that grows against the trunk tissue, where again, if we had planted it high enough up out of the ground, that root, root tissue could never contact trunk tissue and we would never have problems with the girdling root. So um, unfortunately that tree got to be 
10 or 12 inches around and then snapped off in a windstorm because it had a little bit of rot there associated with that uh, girdling root. Um, so just a, a little bit on uh, planting containerized trees and shrubs. Some of them are very root bound like we've talked about before. And a common recommendation is to score the sides of the root ball. You see at the bottom there, we've got a little diagram that shows you take the pot off, you use a knife and cut the roots and then kind of frill them out like that. I think that's a good practice when you open up a pot and it's just packed full of roots. And that helps us to avoid that root bound issue where uh, those circling roots just can't stop circling like they did in the pot and the plant suffers from that. But in cases like this plant, where that's a really good looking root system for a little pine tree, granted I see some circling roots at the top there. If we had a nice root flare at the soil surface, I don't know that I would do all too much to disturb that root system because look at, look at further down in the pot, there's not a lot of roots. And if we start cutting and pulling and ripping roots, we're just actually removing some uh, important material and disturbing you know, some important part of the root system. So if it's kind of a judgment call, but if you pull a plant out of a pot and it has a pretty good looking root system and it's not very root bound, I really don't recommend disturbing that too much. I recommend just getting it planted. And sometimes on a plant like this, I don't think I would ever cut or score it or do anything, but I might kind of pick at the edges and kind of fluff out those roots a little bit Try not to disturb them too much, but just get them pulled away from the ball so they're not sucked into there and they're in good contact with the soil around them when they, when they wind up in the hole. So uh, with bald and burlap trees, there's a lot of material to remove. Um, a lot of times, uh, this is something that we would probably have a landscape company do and things. So just because they're so big and heavy and hard, it takes a couple people to handle and get into the hole right, get them straight is really difficult when you have a really heavy bald and burlap tree. But if you do hire a landscape company to plant these, don't let them tell you that all that material can just stay in the hole. The common thing I hear is, oh, burlap's biodegradable. You can just leave the burlap on. It'll, it'll you know, disintegrate into the soil and your tree will be fine. Well, we really need to get all that material gone because if this picture at the right kind of shows a perfect example of what happens if you leave that burlap on. Um, I would expect those roots coming out of the ball for the size of trunk that is right there I'd expect those roots, some of them maybe even to be as big around as my arm. And where we've got pencil sized roots coming out of there because they were stuck and bound up in that burlap till it did, as you can see here, it eventually decomposed and was gone. But uh, anyway, so that's a major impediment. That wire basket needs to come out too because someday that trunk can get large enough, it would contact the wire basket and would have problems. Uh, but you don't necessarily have to get, because that ball is so, so heavy, if you have a little bit of that wire cage um, that's below 12 inches down, it can just stay in the hole and just be there forever. Um, you know, it's really that top 12 inches of soil that we're most worried about. Same with the burlap. If the best you can do is cut it back and poke it down in below 12 inches or so, that's fine too. So some material can kind of stay in the hole if you can't get it out from under the, the ball and burlap. But the point is you do need to really loosen up for the top 12 inches of that ball. You really want it absolutely free and open and in contact uh, with the soil. So after we've dug our nice wide uh, shallow hole, uh, it's time to back, and we've got our tree in at the right depth, it's time to backfill. So um, if we found a really jumbled up mixture of uh, mixed up urban soil with chunks of concrete and different colored soils all jumbled up and mixed into the hole, probably want to amend that hole and backfill with, with good soil, you know, and, and what's good soil? I, you know, if I found that mixed up, jumbled up uh, mixture from construction, I think I would add about one third finished compost. So you can either, like I said before, my, one of my favorite places is the Landscape Recycling Center in Urbana to get something like that. And you can get it, you know, for about $25, I can get a whole four by eight trailer load of that. Uh, or you could go to a garden center and you could buy just organic humus is a lot of times what it's called, um, or organic material. Um, or um, you can even buy actual garden soil, but I uh, don't necessarily need that. You can take uh, the bad soil you dug out of the hole and just add again, just about a third compost to two thirds soils for your backfill and that's good. So important thing to remember is a tree and a shrub, they're not like a tomato plant where we would really wanna have just the best soil going back in. We may even add fertilizer and other things. Trees don't take a high nutrient content. They're more sensitive to the drainage and the structure of that soil. So that's why adding back in some organic matter helps, helps with drainage. It helps the soil retain some moisture as well. And it helps 
with nutrient cycling that naturally happens in the soil. So we don't really ever have to fertilize a tree. It's just, if we can simply add well loosened, good soil back into the hole, uh, we're good to go. So we do wanna leave a small berm or donut. In this picture, you can't quite see that because I put the mulch over the top of that tree before I got a picture of it. But um, if you could have seen before the mulch was on, where that tree's at, there's a little depression that's about six inches. And all around the rest of the outside of that fill area, it's humped up a little bit. And that's because everything there is gonna settle over the next six months. So in six months, this tree, actually right now, this tree probably looks pretty level with the ground surface, where the day I planted it, it was probably six or eight inches there almost above the level of the soil surface. So uh, we're always gonna wanna apply mulch, you know, and about two to four inches deep is what we want. Always wanna keep it away from the base of the tree trunk, um, because again, that root flare area is really important and um, we don't want to ever cover it up with soil or mulch. So what's some of the follow-up care we need to do after we get this tree in the ground? Uh, we probably want to water it at least once a week, or I guess the old rule of thumb, I probably need to add this to this uh, slide, is just any week that we get one inch of rainfall throughout the week, your tree is fine. It's whenever we get to about July and we start to get less than an inch of rain a week, uh, you need to start trying to add that inch of rain yourself. That's why we say water about once a week. Um, and what's, you know, what's the best way to water? Um, a, a deep, infrequent watering. So a deep, thorough watering that's less frequent is better than watering a little bit every day. And the reason being, uh, woody plants don't get watering every day in a little tiny dose in the wild. That's not how they've evolved to grow and deal with soil moisture. So the way they're used to getting it is in the form of a rain event where we would get a lot of rain at once and then it would stop and dry out and be dry for a while. So that's, that's the optimal situation. If you could apply one inch of rainfall a week, you know, or, or water, water your tree for, you know, one hour a week with a garden hose on a trickle, that'd probably be about the best thing we could do. Uh, so I always get questions about staking and guying. Um, you know, a lot of people want to put a stake on a tree every time they plant it, and that's not really the case. Um, I really would never stake a tree unless it was necessary to hold that tree up. So what are the cases where that happens? Um, probably a large bald and burlap tree, if it's a really large one, you're probably going to want a stake on it to hold it up. And I usually add more than one stake. Um, but another case is um, another way to get plants that I didn't really show very well in my different plant materials is you can get... Uh, a three to five foot tall tree um, through mail order that's bare root. So that means all the soil has been taken off its roots. It's packed into a big tall box and it comes to you and you plant it in the ground with, you know, a reduced root system because they had to kind of root prune it down to get it in the box. But uh, those trees tend to be a little top heavy and there's just not a big wad of soil attached to the roots when you get them. So they kind of want to flop over. So that's one I might consider staking. But uh, don't always just stake because. Um, when we do stake a tree like you see in some of these pictures, uh, it, it actually reduces, and especially if we stake it really tight, uh, it reduces the amount of wind throw on the, on the tree stem. So the trunk above ground, as it grows and develops into a large shade tree, it does that in reaction to the environment and wind pressure and, and getting blown around. And, and if it doesn't have that exposure in the environment, it may not develop wood fiber where it needs to be sturdy and structurally sound as a mature tree. So uh, don't always stake, and if you do, it needs to be loose. I really don't like the version of guy wires at the right there and C. Probably my favorite way to stake is like B, but I do three posts. I usually use T posts that I just pound in. And then I just have kind of a, not a tight, but a loose little strap of nylon webbing. So that's kind of like what seatbelt material is made out of. You can buy some cheaper versions of that. I think I've seen it marketed as tree tape. That's what it's called a lot. Um, but just a, and, and the point being, whatever contacts the trunk, you want it to be flat and wide and not skinny and tight. Like I really don't like, you know, again, see where they've guy, they've used guy wires. Those are easy to trip on. They're kind of a nightmare in the landscape. And then uh, I always picture that diagram kind of being the good old fashioned wire with a garden hose through it, you know, around it. And although that looks like it spreads it out, really over time that garden hose starts to degrade and it really starts to cut into the trunk almost and again restrict that conductive tissue that's right under the uh, bark there. So um, so if you only stake when you have to, if you do try and get a stake on there from you know support from three different directions and again not tight so that 
that stem can still wobble in the wind a little bit. Basically your stake is just, if, if the wind blows really hard and pushes that tree several feet in one direction or really hard one direction, your um, staking is just gonna stop it from keep, keeping going, but you still want it to be able to move and wiggle a little bit. So one really innovative way to do that is with, uh, by staking the root ball like you see here. It's just a little more complex, takes a little more effort. You need to have the wood on hand and things, but in the end here, you can mulch just about up over that wood and you don't see it that well. And in this case, we, it's, it works perfectly because it holds the root ball in place where the trunk can kind of wobble a little bit. So anyway, uh, so there's some ideas for staking. Um, let's talk a little bit just about care, tree and shrubs. We've kind of talked about mulching before, but uh, before now in this presentation, but again, mulching is one of just the best single practices for tree health we can do um, it conserves moisture. It actually mimics, you know, a, so a forested environment where we would have a layer of leaves at the top. Uh, you know, instead we're putting wood here, wood chips that decompose slower than leaves, but basically mimics the natural forested ecosystem trees evolved in where there's like a nice layer of organic matter that the soil surface that's slowly decomposing into the soil and conserving moisture and adding organic, organic matter at the same time. Um, if we could plant, if we could apply mulch as wide as the drip line of a tree, and in this case, this you know big mature oak tree on a golf course has just the ideal mulching setting, that's perfect. That's great. It's all the way out past the drip line. It's getting as much of the root system of that tree as we can. I realize in the and you got in the landscape in our yard and places we plant trees, we don't always have the the liberty to take a, a a mulch ring all the way out to the drip line. So we have to maybe compromise with what we can get but just understand the more of a tree's root system you can add mulch to the healthier that tree is going to be and it's just really again one of the single most best tree care practices we can do uh, definitely we've kind of I've kind of hammered this home today but don't plant it too deep don't apply that mulch too deep do I think bagel not muffin so or, or tree volcanoes I think is what I see a lot of social media and other places call these um, that's just one of the it happens all the time I think it's just folks that don't understand uh, that the root flare is as important as, as it is and they're trying to do a lot of trees in a day and that's an easy way to get that mulch around there and if you've ever mulched a tree you know with with time with sun and wind and everything uh, it tends to move around and move away so I think folks think if they pile it up like that it'll stay around the base of the tree longer as as it starts to right away but that's that's really damaging uh, so watering yeah getting just the right amount of water is commonly a problem um, you know, we're trying, again, we're trying to get about that one inch a week. Um, I think this is about my favorite way to water a newly planted tree, especially like the day of planting. If you can just put a dripping garden hose on it for an hour or two and just thoroughly soak that area that you dug up, that's about the best way to allow the soil to get moistened, for it to settle some, and for it not to erode away. If we just turn that garden hose on full blast right there and we just dug that hole, it's going to wash soil around and things. So Dripping garden hose, I think, is the best way. Um, throughout the summer, you could just bring a garden hose over once a week to do it. That would work fine. Um, another method of, that I really like if I'm doing more than one tree, or I have, I have a soaker hose that I like to put out around trees, that's a great way. And you can just turn the hose on and let that soaker hose run. Again, a deep and frequent, you know, once a week, maybe run it for an hour. Um, let it thoroughly soak that area. But um, that's a great way. It's pretty efficiently get water to a, a tree. I don't like a sprinkler because it just, it, you lose a lot of water to evaporation and other things, but I've used sprinklers and it's fine. You just have to realize that you're probably gonna use more water um, to get the same amount into the soil and on the roots. Um, if you don't have access with a hose or something, they make these wonderful little tree gators is what they call, that's maybe one of the brand names for these, but I don't like the bag at the top right because it, uh, Again, we're kind of enclosing the root flare and things, but these are nice because you could you can unzip that bag from the tree, you can fill it up at a hose, and if you if if your hose won't reach to the far back corner of your yard where you planted that tree, you could carry this bag out, and there's your um, watering for the week. Um, I prefer the kind that are more donut shaped, like the one at the bottom, so we're not uh, constricting the root color. But if you don't want to buy one of these twenty or thirty dollar tree bags. Um, I've done the same thing with a bucket that I sacrificed to this and just drilled some little holes in the bottom. So, you know, you fill it up at your spigot and you walk out to the tree and you're losing some water all the way to the tree. But once you set it down, most all that water winds up on the tree. 
with three or four of these buckets or doing multiple bucket runs, it's just the, the poor man's way of getting some water to, to a tree. So with that, I think we can open things up to any questions. Um, and here's some of my contact info. Again, I work for U of I Extension. My job is outreach about plants and any plant question I usually try and answer either myself or with, with other experts around the state I can access for answers to questions. Uh, feel free to email me, call me. I do write a weekly blog that is also runs in the News Gazette as a, a column called In the Garden. Every Saturday I have a News Gazette column that then I also post to my blog, the Garden Scoop blog. Um, so again, with that, if anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute yourselves and happy to talk a little bit, or even if it's not about tree planting, happy to talk about any other, we've got the luxury of a small group and some time, so. Okay, well, um, thank you all for joining us today. I, I do I enjoy talking to a smaller group. I think it gives us a little more time for um, action if we wanted to, but uh, anyway, uh, if there's not any questions, I think I'll go ahead and end our presentation for today, but really appreciate you guys joining us. And if you get into some questions on, should I plant this tree here? Does this grow good in Illinois? How do I plant it? How do I do any of these things? My tree is a disease. I, I cover a lot of questions related to uh, trees and shrubs. Um, I, I'm a vegetable gardener, so I do, I answer a lot of questions about vegetable disease and things. If it gets into too ornamental of a flower, I probably would have to talk with someone else, but um, anyway. Uh, go ahead, Diane, did you have a question? Okay, well, uh, again, thanks so much for joining us. I'm gonna go ahead and end our presentation and certainly shoot me an email or look me up and give me a call if you have a question. Happy to answer those and thanks so much. Enjoy the beautiful Saturday we've got. Yes? Oh. I guess I have to hold the space bar down to ask you a quick question. Are you still there, Ryan? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, go ahead, Diane. Okay, okay, I live in, in a woods with lots of large oak trees, and I've noticed over time, though, the mulch builds up around the outer uh, section of the tree. Are, so thinking about the tree on the golf course there, do they rake up the old mulch each year, or do they allow that layer of mulch to get higher and higher? Uh, I would guess in this, in this situation on a golf course, are, are you guys still seeing my screen share? I can't tell if I'm still sharing or not. I can, I can see questions, uh, the questions uh, last frame of the video. Let's see. Yeah, it's probably, it's probably looking a little weird. Okay, there we go. Uh, it does look a little weird, yeah. So my, my question is about over time, mulch can build up, and is that a good thing or not a good thing? And if you don't rake the old away, you know, I live in a forest, and we live in Illinois, so little things start sprouting up in the mulch and growing big in the mulch, and you have to constantly weed the mulch. Yeah, um, I, how I handle it at my house, I, I don't ever remove mulch, I keep adding it. And, okay. you know, I think there's probably some research I haven't read on this, because I, I was at an arborist conference maybe last winter or fall, and gave a presentation on just native trees and shrubs and things. We were talking about mulching afterwards, and one of the guys there, another arborist, mentioned that uh, there's some maybe research that shows if we get mulch too thick, we can start to compact the soil a little bit. Um, I haven't read those papers, so I don't know what, I, I haven't digested all that, but I think it's maybe true that if we got, you know, 12 inches of mulch piled up out there, it maybe would start to compress soil a little bit, but in my experience, you know, we have a relatively temperate warmer climate uh, that mulch kind of decomposes fast enough under there that you know by the time I'm adding I, I tend to try and put it pretty thick I mean I know the recommended thickness is two to four inches I'm probably more like six to eight sometimes when I mulch but then I get like two or three years out of that mulching but um, yeah the thing with mulch is there is a weeding issue uh, you're always gonna yes how do, what how do you deal with that I, I hand pull stuff is what I do. So I just, I mean, as you might imagine, I like messing around in my garden a lot. So <laughs> going out and hand pulling or what sometimes I'll do is I have a little hoe that I'll just yank out a plant and it pulls up some soil right there. And then I kind of 
have not a bucket for not only the plant, but a little bit of that soil. Because if you just left, if you pulled a plant out, it pulls soil up through the mulch and leaves a little soil right. up that a seed could grow on. If you just kind of take that little handful of soil and mulch in the weed and throw it all in a bucket, it's great compost and then smooth the mulch back over right there if it's a bigger weed. I try and get them though, when they're small enough, I can just hand pull the whole thing out. Um, really what I try and shoot for too in a lot of my gardening beds is uh, plants I want there that are competitive enough that form a, you know, a layer that blocks out light. And so, you know, obviously underneath trees, one of the best is hostas. That's one of my favorites and easiest. Right to establish. I mean, there's other shrubs and things we could add in there. There's other ground covers. Um, U of I Extension and Sea Grant and a couple others just went together to put together some uh, real neat little handouts on native plants. And one of those is Woodland Shade Gardens. And it shows a whole selection of natives we could do in a shade garden that would, you know, a lot of those are competitive enough they can close out light. You know, one of them they would recommend is violets, which I, I don't know if you've dealt with those good or bad, whether you like them or not, they're natives, a lot of them, and they actually do get competitive enough in the shade that they can be this little ground cover of stuff. So there's some things we maybe don't think of as a ground cover. Wild, wild ginger is another one that kind of looks like violets that I think actually turns into a beautiful, uh, you know, ground cover. Um, so there's a lot of other things, but that's, I try to use plants to work for me as much as possible, you know, and if you can get them in there and competitive and keeping out weeds, that's about the best, but um, unfortunately, yeah, mulch beds just take a lot of weeding. And that's why I say when I, when I recommend mulching out to the drip line, I realize there's limitations. And one of those may be our ability to maintain a mulch bed. And maybe we realize that we can only go 10 feet from the trunk in an area that we would maintain. But um, that, the golf course picture here is kind of the ideal, you know, the perfect picture for that oak tree. And they probably have a landscape crew that's out there weeding that or raking the mulch or doing whatever they can. But yeah, but that's just uh, one of the maintenance issues of a landscape. I okay, th thanks. I've done most of those things. We have a lot of wild, a lot of ground cover, wild ginger, a lot of violets, a lot of Solomon seal. I, I just was looking for new ideas to deal with what's coming up through the mulch. And thank you. Yeah, sure. Well, it sounds like you've you've got the right ideas, so you're doing the right thing. All right, thanks. Thank you. Yep. All right. Well. Great question, Diane, and thanks everybody else for joining us. I think I'll go ahead and wrap things up, but um, like I said, uh, please reach out if you do have some tree questions or plant questions, and always happy to answer those. So uh, thanks again, and you guys have a wonderful Saturday.